see the fundamental shift that has to be brought in the country is to make the states and the local bodies realize that laying of optical fiber cable and giving access to telecom infrastructure is going to be the backbone and is going to give benefits to the state and to the city therefore it should not be looked as a source of income and revenue but something to be given support of to give access to better quality of telecom connectivity to the larger population in the region so let me uh, first uh, welcome uh, mr uh, sunil kumar singhal uh, advisor broadband and uh, policy uh, dri uh, he has more than 25 years of 24 years of uh, experience in telecommunication and uh, broadcasting sectors in his present capacity uh, he is handling the policy and regulatory issues related to the uh, broadband services and intercon- interconnection of services so welcome mr sunil kumar singhal to the webinar today thank you thank you so much and uh, i also uh, welcome on this uh, uh, session mr balaji uh, who is the chief regulatory uh, and the corporate affairs officer one of one ideal uh, ideal limited uh, he i think balaji has been in this industry for quite some time he recently joined in 2018 august uh, uh, oda india idea so in leading the regulatory policy uh, government relations activities and balaji held the very uh, very senior leadership levels positions in startup companies done around uh, many organizations uh, in in the tata groups and at&t ericsson sony i think currently is been uh, very actively working with uh, vodafone uh, idea limited let me also let me welcome uh, mr rahul words uh, chief regulatory officer airtel rahul has a lot of expertise in this regulatory policy and the licensing uh, a spectrum with more than 24 years of his experience and i was told that he is responsible for almost getting 30 telecom licenses in last 12 years which is not easy so but i will uh, also will bring a lot of insights around this uh, regulatory framework for reformation to try so i will welcome to this session thank you mr rao we have uh, uh, mr vishakha saigal uh, joining us from uh, geo uh, geo and head strategic uh, Uh, initiatives regulatory policy and research uh, at geo uh, she comes with a very rich experience uh, in uh, ict uh, communication technologies and a business advisory professional with uh, extensive uh, consulting experience across telecom technology education and media sectors vishaka welcome you to the session thank you mr rao for the warm welcome thank you so much Introduced, I think, uh, Mr. Anku Jain uh, just joined so, MD Media Tech. Uh, Anku uh, is uh, heading this Media Tech business uh, and uh, responsible for Pan India operations. And Media Tech is a leading Taiwanese-based uh, global fabless uh, semiconductor company uh, that uh, powers more than uh, 1.5 billion of uh, devices per year. Uh, for rollout of the networks, still there are administrative bottlenecks. I agree. but uh, what i want to emphasize is that uh, uh, this problem is not unique to india world over policy makers regulators and industry participants are working together to address this crucial issue however you are right that this issue becomes more highlighted in india because we don't have other infrastructures uh, like common duct infrastructure which is there in other parts of the world thank you so much mr rao i think the government and the regulator and the industry players are in continuous dialogue to ensure that indian citizens can get the latest technologies and latest innovations are introduced in the services that you offer so whether it is uh, blockchain technologies or iot technologies a lot of uh, proactive steps have been taken in fact with the support of uh, regulator tri the industry has uh, done a world first implementation of blockchain based uh, uh, ucc uh, um, services so let me start by saying that the telecom providers are already bound uh, by very strict licensing conditions uh, which require us to ensure uh, consumer privacy and also storage uh, you know of the personal information of our customers uh, however i will urge that the issue of privacy and security 
of personal data uh, is not just limited to the TSPs. In fact, the issue is more critical for all sectors and the way services. Also, we really need to become independent uh, in our in our manufacturing, in our capability in India. So, for that aspect, uh, MediaTek is also cooperating with several uh, uh, Indian uh, players and Indian OEM. Uh, yes, thanks to the collective efforts of the government, regulator, and industry, we have made uh, rapid strides in technology evolution from older technologies to 4G. Uh, today, we've seen and witnessed how 4G has transformed and impacted the lives of millions of Indians in India uh, in a very, very positive manner in a very, very short span of time. Uh, today, all of us are gearing for the big 5G. Uh, great talking to you, all of you. Thanks for joining uh, all of you uh, to be on this uh, uh, panel today. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the 25 years of mobility series, Desh Ke Digital Udaan. We are celebrating 25 years of mobility in India and today's episode is titled Network Affordability, Trendsetter Forecast, Business and Service Transformation. 2020 marks the completion of 25 years of mobile communications in India. STL and Nokia are also celebrating the completion of 25 years in the Indian telecom and technology market. This is a huge moment for the industry and that is what the series is all about. The objective of this series is not only to celebrate the last 25 years, rather it is also to discuss the roadmap and possibilities for the next 25 years and how India is going to become a world leader in the areas of telecommunications and technology. We're bringing 5G to everyone across mobile, automotive, IoT, in the home and beyond. Introducing MediaTek Dimensity. MediaTek Dimensity is at the forefront of powering the 5G revolution. It's about what we can achieve when barriers between devices disappear and connectivity becomes seamless and instantaneous. It will change market, industries, and our everyday. Through Dimensity, we're spurring product and service innovations that will enable the true possibilities of 5G connectivity. When you see Dimensity, know that MediaTek has built an unrivaled mix of technologies. The industry's fastest 5G connectivity, super fast processors, and incredible gaming. Exciting multimedia, the industry's most powerful AI cores, and impressive imaging. With MediaTek Dimensity, expect incredible. To start the proceedings, I invite Lieutenant General SP Kochur, DG, COAI, to deliver the welcome address. Dr. Kochur is a decorated military veteran and leader par excellence. He retired as the Chief Signal Officer of the Indian Army. He was also the first CEO of Telecom Sector Skill Council. 
His interests include using new age technologies like blockchain, IoT, big data, DSP, and artificial intelligence, including AR and VR, for proving optimum innovative solutions in the Indian context. He also has keen interests in 5G and its optimum utilization. Dr. Kocher. In this year, 2020, we complete 25 successful years of mobile telephony and digital services in India. In these 25 years, the telecom networks in India have witnessed tremendous transformation from 2G to 4G. And now we are headed towards 5G. The Indian telcos were the pioneers in the outsourcing model, which has defined a new trend in the telecom networks across the globe. Driven by the outsourcing model, in which the Indian providers outsource the networks, the passive infrastructure, that is the towers and the sites, IT infrastructure, vast infrastructure, and current consideration in sharing the active infrastructure and spectra, the telecom networks in today are state of the heart and some of the most robust in the world. With 4G network across India and continued deployment of fiber to the home, telecom services have become a mainstay of many sectors, and most of them have incorporated these into their core activities, thus reducing the cost of physical infrastructure, increasing reach, and transforming the delivery of services. Ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the fourth episode themed Network Affordability, Trendsetter for Cost, Business, and Service Transformation of a webinar series, Desh Ki Digital Ura. Operators are increasingly seeking ways to grow revenue and cut costs in a high growth environment, which is made more complicated by the demanding requirements of new services that is high speed, low latency, and ultra reliability. Operators therefore need to evolve their networks using innovations such as virtual RAN, edge computing, and network automation to meet the demands of the 4G or 5G era. Today, operators are looking at innovative business models and moving towards multi-vendor network automation and monitoring services. Currently, technology advancements such as cloud, AI, network orchestration, and modernization are all contributing to more efficient network functioning. To know this more and understand from the operators, CTOs, it is my honor to welcome our guests for this episode. Shri Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary at Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Mr. Randeep Shekho, CTO of Bharti Airtel. Mr. Vishant Vora, CTO of Vodafone Idea. Mr. Sham Madhikar, CTO of Reliance Geo Infocom. Mr. Sandeep Dhingra, CTO of Network Services Business, STL. Mr. Vikram Anand, Senior Director Sales, Siena Communications. Mr. David Stokes, Senior Manager, Solutions Marketing, Ribbon Communication. And of course, Mr. Amit Marwa, Head of Marketing and Corporate Affairs, Nokia, will be a moderator for this panel. In this panel, the panelists will discuss about the convergence of technologies, communication and computing interplay, service delivery, network infrastructure, its compatibility, complexity, and affordability, along with measures of how to decrease OPEX and CAPEX and further increase eff efficiency and investments in telecom networks. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. Be a seed, the one that shoots up, springs, life that kindles, never dies out. Arrow, a goal that inspires, future that intrigues, amazes, in a new, fresh, invigorated form to take the giant stride. STL Beyond Tomorrow. The ways that we make things have changed overnight. Once wired and tethered, we're now wireless and light, and at least twice as smart with our digital twins, for in this new making, the agile one wins. So when markets or customers say, I've changed my mind, we bend like a yogi, rethink and refine. We act on our insights and make a new line. The brain is the network, so nimble, so smart, secure and reliable, in essence, the heart that fuels the new making and all it can be 
From shipping to logistics to factory to sea. Go all where. Networking solutions for the new age of industry, like manufacturing. Nokia. Thank you, Dr. Kuchu. Before we move ahead with the program, I'll take a moment to announce the dates for India Mobile Congress 2020. IMC 2020 will be held virtually from 8 December to 10th December, and the partnerships are now available to be secured. You can contact info at indiamobilecongress.com for more details. We have a number of industry experts with us today who will take this discussion forward. And I would like to welcome Professor Shri Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, to deliver the keynote. At DST, Professor Sharma has helped initiate several new programs related to infrastructure and human capacity building, innovation and startups, R&D in advanced manufacturing, waste processing, clean energy and cyber physical systems, industry academia cooperation, science communication, women scientists, and major international collaborations in the areas of priority for the nation. Uh, I'm delighted that CEO AI has put together this brilliant program, this conference on 25 years of mobility in India. Deshki Digital Uran, the unprecedented development and progress across the nation brought about through digital services is gearing to contribute $1 trillion out of a dollar, uh, $5 trillion economy, which also creates countless jobs. The sheer uh, transformation which I'm witnessing in India through the digital spread and the resulting empowerment of Indians is genuinely remarkable. And there's one story I would like to share. In terms of promising a digital economy, India is going to become a prominent name to reckon with in the global map. And I'm really delighted to be part of this very significant milestone in Indian telecom industry, making 25 years of mobile telephony in the country. We have a long way in the field of science and technology. It's not just a vertical anymore, but it's really horizontal that cuts across every sector, every activity uh, that we undertake. Now, in emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, and 5G are significantly impacting the processes. And aspirations in critical sectors such as manufacturing, education, healthcare, agriculture, financial, uh, and social uh, activities. Development of these technologies has the potential to disrupt and change the working of all these sectors which will lead to an innovative wave and add, indeed, immense value. Uh, the future is coming at us at faster and faster rate. Uh, the future is all about convergence of technologies. Uh, what are these technologies and what does the convergence mean? Uh, well, it's all about smart materials, uh, stimuli responsive materials, uh, working together uh, with communication technologies, uh, data transmission, data handling, perception through sensors, uh, data analytics, making autonomous decisions based on data and information, uh, using artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and finally making autonomous actions uh, through actuators. Uh, so, so it is everything that we are going to be doing in future uh, is a combination and integration, a convergence of these technologies from communication to computation, uh, to perception, uh, to action. Uh, this convergence of technologies is impacting the missions which are launched by Department of Science and Technology. Uh, one such mission is on cyber physical systems, which was launched last year uh, at an investment of 3,660 crores, which is setting up now uh, more than 20 hubs across the country. Uh, several of them actually focus on computing and communication and their interplay uh, through artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT. Uh, of course, and communication is no longer uh, confined to person-to-person -person communication. So that's a game changer uh, because we need uh, we need speed. Uh, we certainly need bandwidth. Uh, we need uh, low latency. 
Uh, we need a stability of communication. Uh, imagine a surgeon which is guiding a surgery uh, through communication, uh, through robotics. Uh, so it's clear that we are entering an era of communication which is unprecedented, which is qualitatively different from what we have been doing in the past. Uh, so uh, visual communication, of course, uh, uh, becomes uh, very important. Uh, so that requires uh, downloading, communicating very large chunks of data uh, with the speed and scale. Industry 4.0 is a good example of machine to machine communication and communication between things. Uh, and so Industry 4.0 uh, would, uh, would certainly be powered by the twins of communication and computing. With the 5G and realization of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, service delivery and operations are getting increasingly complex. We need to utilize machine learning and leverage intent-driven closed-loop autonomous operations, driving business agility, agility uh, and offer differentiated customer experience. Additionally, with the advent of upcoming technologies, the market and enterprise customers are also expected to transform. They are also expected to be a five-fold increase in economic value from India's digital transformation by 2025. And this would create a rapidly growing market uh, for a host of digital services, platforms, applications, content, and solutions. And uh, this represents an attractive opportunity for global and local businesses uh, so this is all about being local. Uh, often the science that drives these transformations is global, uh, but the technology that we use finally uh, has local aspirations, needs, and priorities in it. Uh, it's going to drive startups and platform-based innov innovators who would be investing in emerging technologies. Thinking about the startups and innovation, uh, Department of Science and Technology has been a, a, has been a major part of this evolving journey. Uh, uh, it has done in the last five years for incubators and startups more than what was done in the previous 50 years. There are now 150 incubators with 4,000 technology companies which are operating. Uh, they are bringing in value for the high tech. Several of these uh, startups are focused on computing, artificial intelligence, communication, and clearly, communication of the future is driven more by software, or at least equally by software, as with hardware, uh, with algorithms. Uh, so all of that is happening with great speed uh, and with great uh, intent and great skill. A new programs on technology fusion and application research is an example uh, of the program launched recently by the Department of Science and Technology. There are ever-increasing technological requirements of the society and considering the international trends of next-gen technologies, uh, this program will boost research for fusion, convergence, and application of emerging technologies such as quantum enabled science and technology, imaging spectroscopy, uh, epidemiological data analytics, and Indian heritage in digital space. Uh, these are very interesting things happening all around. Uh, for example, looking at uh, heritage in digital space uh, is about maintaining our heritage in uh, architecture, in monuments, in old paintings like in Ajanta, reconstructing them, uh, and also a very interesting new technologies wherein one can digitally scan a monument, then create a 3D replica of it uh, by printing, uh, and then be able to take a virtual walk in it. Uh, so the virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality are some other applications which are going to drive uh, the sector and the need for communication. Um, another interesting example is the rise of quantum technologies. Uh, this is a new program, a new national mission which is in the offing uh, in, in a short time. It was announced in the last uh, budget speech. Uh, it would uh, foresee an investment of uh, rupees 8,000 crores. And this will again be a, a, a transformative mission because uh, it would uh, include uh, not just quantum computing, uh, 
uh, but uh, more importantly to my mind quantum communication quantum cryptography quantum algorithms quantum devices quantum sensors of all kinds which are going to become increasingly um, important uh, in the years and decades and indeed the centuries to come so what we are looking at here is all the future of humanity uh, and this we're talking about the future of humanity even after covid-19 has disappeared from the margins of history books uh, we will still have these overarching challenges of sustainable development of health care for all uh, for climate change the rise of antimicrobial resistance and you know these are huge huge challenges together with the rise of intelligent machines and if you really look carefully uh, communication uh, is an integral part of addressing these challenges uh, in a way uh, that leads to sustainable development uh, reaching the last mile reaching the last person for digital delivery of health or health care uh, certainly one couldn't envisage that in the absence of uh, right effective communication so when it's about agriculture is about informing our farmers is informing uh, our uh, fishermen about the right opportunities uh, in their uh, trade uh, communication uh, would uh, continue to play ever greater role in that but like i said we have to be fully ready uh, for the change the opportunities and challenges that the future brings i wish the organizers uh, a huge uh, success and congratulate them for putting together uh, such a delightful event such a useful event uh, which is appropriate and and very topical and very timely i am sure the next 25 years in india we will be a global game changer now game changer of course is a little bit of a cliche uh, but what you would like to say is that look we we we, we used to talk about leaf frogging even leaf frogging is not an option anymore uh, what we have to do is pole vaulting and so with uh, be totally ready for disruptive changes and in fact be part of those changes not just part of the problem but part of the solution so thank you very much again uh, all the best uh, going forward in the future thank you professor sharma that was insightful now let's move on to the panel discussion with our industry experts the panel will be moderated by mr amit marwa head of marketing and corporate affairs nokia before nokia mr marwa held senior positions in huawei and motorola at huawei he held the position of director for networks global solution sales support while at motorola he contributed as a senior manager amit also served as head converged core solution sales management and chief technology officer for nokia between 2005 and 2009 Mr Marwa over to you Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this discussion that we're going to have on network affordability um the last 25 years as a journey in India has been phenomenal you all are aware from no subscribers to almost 1.1 billion subscribers the second highest number of users uh, in the world the highest data consuming market in the world uh the tele density at urban level reaching 150% rural tele density also going up substantially to 60% i think we've had a phenomenal journey uh, in the last 25 years of taking uh, mobility to where it is and thanks to the networks that we have set up but not only have we reached these milestones i think the bigger uh, thing has been that in india we have been trend setters in a number of new initiative new business models and just to give you an example of few of them managed services as a business model was something which was conceived and made successful in india managed capacity as a model uh, extremely successful in india infra sharing tower companies and tower co set up as a big business case uh, and a successful one again an innovation out of india and more recently i think uh, use cases like voice over lt having the num largest number of deployments cloud deployments in india having probably superseded or one of the largest in the world so we have taken uh, initiative and we have done things in our networks which are trend setters for the world and all of us have been part of this journey from the tsp to the entire ecosystem in order to be able to contribute uh, building the networks up to now uh, for 4g 
But I think at the core of all this has been efficiency. Efficiency that we have tried to extract of our networks, the CSPs, all the operators have done uh, in order to create the best business case, the best amount of juice that can be extracted out of every part of the network. And I think we've had an extremely, extremely uh, focused um, uh, journey around uh, this. Uh, trying to create the best possible capex and opex models in order to run telecom networks in the world. Uh, this discussion that we have is all about uh, network affordability. Um, yes, we have done a lot in the past, but there is lots more that can be done and will be done in the future with technologies like artificial intelligence, cloud, and so many things as networks transform to 5G. And I think it's our chance again, as in India, to lead the world in making a transformation and being the transitors once again. And for this, I have an extremely, extremely, uh, I would say, the best panel that anybody could dream of with not only the trendsetters themselves, the decision makers, but people who have been part of this journey for a long time and have contributed and are sitting on the driver's seat. So with further, uh, without losing any time, let me introduce the panel to us. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Vishant Vora, CTO for Vodafone Idea, now branded as V. A member of the national leadership team, Vishant is responsible for network, IT operations, and overall technology strategy. Prior to his present role, Vishant was director of technology at Vodafone India, where he spearheaded the technology and network infrastructure for the company. A career telecom professional, Vishant has spent more than two and a half decades in telecom technology, building expertise in three continents, USA, Europe, and Asia. He graduated as a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Michigan. Welcome, uh, Vishan. Uh, the second panelist I have, um, again, needs no introduction, Mr. Randeep Sethko, the CTO of Bharti Airtel. Uh, with his unique mix of business, leadership, experience, and deep technology understanding, to drive his success, Randeep is transforming the position of mobile operators from access providers to digital lifestyle providers, delivering value to its customers via a customer first and digital first strategy. He has a unique mix of business leadership experience and a deep technology understanding to drive business success and turnaround. His experience in the technology leadership roles have enabled him to leverage technology and digital first approach for the enterprise value generation. Welcome, uh, Randeep, to this panel. Uh, the third panelist, again, needs little introduction and a dear friend, Sham Madikar, CEO of Reliance CEO and so on. Uh, technology or leadership more than 24 years in telecom in, uh, the telecommunication industry, across networks and IT domains in strategy, planning, engineering, and operations across India and Europe. A uh, telecom evangelist with an inclusive outlook towards new telecom DNA, right? Is devices, network, and applications. That's the DNA. Uh, instrumental in creating a flatter, closer to the customer service awareness network. Telecom strategist with an innovative and out of the box process for to formulate architecture and technology plans options around spectrum, network evolution, virtualization, and customer experience. Uh, very rich in his experience. Welcome, Sham, to the panel. Uh, we also have in the panel with us Mr. Vikram S. Anand, Senior Director, Sales Siena Communication. Vikram is a Senior Director, uh, and in his role, is responsible for managing, uh, developing Siena's business across Western and Southern India, including sales and business development. Anand joined Sena in May 2020 from VMware, where he was leading the telco and media business vertical in India. Prior to VMware, Anand was also working with, in leadership roles in companies like Cisco and Ericsson and has had a rich experience with telecom IT leaders like Alcatel and Siemens. We also have uh, with us uh, one of the panelists, Mr. Sandeep Dhingra, CTO Network Services, is for SPL, this girl right. Sandeep is focused on driving innovation to enable faster growth in rapidly changing architecture with SDN, NFP, Cloud, IoT, and 5G. 
So we have said leadership positions in Cisco systems, IBM and Huawei. He has several US patents to his name for innovation in health, architecture and analytics. And last but not the least, we have with us Mr. David Stroke, Senior Manager, Solution Marketing Driven Communication. David is a Senior Manager, Solution Marketing at Ribbon, where he's focused in Ribbon's package transport portfolio and package enabled solutions for 4G and 5G mobile transport, mission critical industrial and defense, homeland security and government. He is an experienced professional with extensive telecommunication knowledge, gained from working across all infrastructure technologies like SDH, fixed wireless, IP, MPLS, carrier internet, pawn, optical, etc. Uh, David has also roles in development in system engineering, product strategy, and product management at a number of companies, including Marconi, which is to Blue Technologies, and so So, with that, uh, we have the panel with us, and um, let's start the discussion. Um, I will ask, uh, you know, the lead area, I'll ask the first question to you. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, with this transformation of the network, especially on the path to 5G, uh, things are getting much more complex in terms of how the networks are going to evolve. So at Airtel, how, in spite of all this complexity, uh, are you able or are you thinking that you'll be able to deliver the cost-effective network um, in, in the future? Your thoughts? Yeah, Amit, and I think a very relevant question. While uh, the technology is becoming more complex, there are also tools which are getting available which were not there when we were rolling out probably 4G in early times or definitely pre previous these 2s and 3Gs. So I would say that if we talk about cloud, cloud is one technology which makes it, if it is an orchestrated cloud, for example, it will be making the service deployment much easier, uh, scalability much faster. So I think uh, tools like uh, cloud, tools like AI ML, where you can use them for faster planning, and then uh, automations like where we can have uh, you know zero touch installation, uh, self-healing networks, these are all possibilities which have come through with these new technologies, which makes, while the network's very complex, but also makes the life more automated, which means if you can invest in these in the right time, they will help us deliver and manage. It is not just a deploy, it is also manage these networks or customer experience in much more, I would say, automated way. At Airtel, we know 5G is the next way which is coming. Uh, it's the next G. Uh, it will bring its own set of complexity, not only in RAN, because generally we people talk about 5G as a RAN technology. It is not. It is an ecosystem which only touches RAN as well as transport network, as well as core network, and uh, of course the services. So in 5G, the way Airtel is doing is we are preparing our networks on a core and transport side uh, for uh, automated deployment and automated readiness of network to get ready for 5G. On infra side, we are working, seeing how we can make infra, especially the RAN uh, part. We'll have MIMO technology deployed for 5G. How we can work with our partners to make these uh, um, less power guzzling, less space, and more and more, uh, you can say, efficient uh, to deliver this technology. That said, I think it will be delivered through a partner ecosystem from the supplier partners, from infra partners, and of course, the telcos. That will be the challenge for us delivering it. I would say this also presents us a big opportunity of bringing in a make in India story here, where we can make sure all these technologies get made in India, not only for Indian consumption, but also for the global consumption. That also will bring the cost down. I mean, since the uh, custom duties uh, have been imposed on, uh, and, uh, on the import from a certain set of countries, but all what is manufactured here does not have the custom duties, makes even Airtel's products very cheaper, like our partners like Nokia Ericsson have factories here, and that gives us a benefit. Sena has factory here, that gives us a benefit. So I would say uh, automation, cloud, uh, made in India, and a close working of all partner ecosystem will ensure that the 5G in India is not only fast, it delivers the customer experience, it delivers the promise, but also is not very heavy on CapEx and all. So this is what probably at this stage I would like to comment. Thank you, Randeep. And you very rightly said, uh, have the right tools to deliver and manage the networks of the future. Uh, let me move to you, Sham. So, uh, Randeep did talk about what is required and how and what, what are going to be done. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on how cost 
uh, efficiencies can be delivered to improve margins in the networks of the future? What all needs to be done with the network, which can directly correlate and go into the bottom line of companies like yours and others uh, in order to create the networks uh, more efficient? Thanks, Amit. Uh, just building on what is being discussed, I think one of the core changes which uh, we all uh, can very well understand and empathize as an industry is going digital is bringing an unprecedented increase in both complexity as well as scale. Uh, now, as far as uh, harnessing the economies of scale are concerned, I think we at India um, are really, really good at it. I mean, we know what scale is. We have handled scale. You alluded to more than a billion customers, and I think we've built networks to handle these more than a billion customers very, very efficiently and effectively. But what I believe in this, this time with 5G coming in is the shape and form of the of the whole product suit, the, the portfolio, if I may call it. This has become so orthogonal that the service sets are totally independent of each other. What an enterprise needs versus what a machine needs versus what a retail customer needs versus what somebody at home needs. I think, and there are then multiple vectors. There is a vector of latency. There is a vector of bandwidth. There is a vector of the type of content which we are using, the frequency of transaction, security. So I think what becomes very, very important at the design stage is the ability to understand the scope and span of each one of these each of these service sets, and then kind of design a network which delivers near optimum level not only from an efficiency and utilization perspective, but also from the topology, architecture, and management perspective that, that kind of drives it. The other big thing which is going to happen uh, is now with these kind of scale and this kind of complexity, it will actually become totally infeasible to start managing and running these networks in the old ways which we've been used to. And when I say old ways, I do not mean a manual or an automated way. I mean the way in which the network components adapt themselves or, or, or move themselves according to the way the service suites or, or, the, or the demand factors are, are, are moving. And this is only possible when the underlying systems are aware of what is happening at the service plane. Underlying systems are continuously in real time exchanging data with each other, processing that data so that they can build some kind of intelligence on the fly and then deliver the right set and right kind. And when I said right set and right kind, the underlying simplicity as well as the economics of the service also gets built into it. So how to create, deliver and service the customer, man, machine, enterprise, whatever the set of customers are in the best and the most economical way possible is something which will come out of this tenet of what we call as programmable network. And unless this tenet is built into the end to end ecosystem, right from the software layer, which is self aware, but also to the infrastructure layer, which continuously keeps on updating the, the kind of services, the kind of loads that are undergoing, the kind of services which are uh, handed over to the customer. Uh, unless this all gets stitched together, I think our ability to run, deploy, and create a network of the future will be very, very challenged. So programmability, I think, becomes one of the biggest tenets. Differentiation of service suites according to the demand and supply becomes a big um, capability and the awareness and evolving um, uh, delivery on the real time becomes a big, big cost factor optimization which can um, uh, come into the place. The only other thing which I would like to add going forward in, in, in the digital world, 5G plus as we call it, is Randeep rightly alluded, we are not talking about a new radio here. We are talking about a bigger ecosystem wherein the concept of the first mile and the last mile, the hierarchy of the old networks is, is all kind of collapsing. And once this network cements itself in the, in the in the ecosystem, where every piece of connectivity is just a single hop from core to the uh, device, uh, it automatically tries and create the kind of um, uh, economic value, which makes it so much more worthwhile uh, to go digital and to service billions of customers and hundreds and thousands of service suits. Thanks, Amin. If I can you know, just uh, summarize what you said was that complexity and scale is our challenges, but designing the right network, which is programmable and simple, will help create the economies for the future. I think uh, that summarizes what you said in all extremely rightly. Moving on to you, Vishan. 
um, uh, a similar question, but I would like you to stress more on the challenges that you see or what you have been feeling, facing. You have been building some of the, um, you know, the, the biggest cloud networks uh, already in India uh, and doing huge, uh, massive MIMO, etc. deployment. So some challenges you have faced and some you think are going to be coming as the networks transform uh, in the future. Thank you, Amit. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to echo what uh, Randeep and Sham have already said, that 5G is not just, uh, not like the other G upgrades. This is a completely different architecture, uh, re, you know, rethought end-to-end, -end, including all different domains of the network. So, what we have been doing, Amit, is actually, you know, we looked at this, uh, couple of years ago as we were uh, getting ready to merge our two uh, networks between Vodafone and Idea. And we we said that let's go on a journey. So we, at the end of the journey, we are ready for that world of tomorrow. Well, we will have a platform which is very much like 5G, even if, it, it, even if 5G is not officially adopted, but it will have many capabilities of a 5G network. And what will be the, the key success factors required to get there. And other than just reducing prices and costs, which is always important in India, what we also said is, you know, it's gonna be incredibly important to build those capabilities to capture new business opportunities. And so the big challenge is not only reducing cost and then achieving scale, but it is also about creating those capabilities. So some of the challenges that, that we have encountered on this journey and that I see going forward is that as we try to cloudify our network more and more, it, it is very important that we try to make it universal. So that cloud should be able to host as many different network applications, IT applications, third party applications as possible. So therefore, we are able to spread the cost of that investment across multiple different things. And at the same time, because now we'll have multiple applications sitting on the same cloud, you can do things in terms of improving experience, in terms of creating new capabilities, new services, which are differentiated uh, in the market and which are more personalized for the, for the whether it is an enterprise client or a, or a consumer client. So in order to do that, it is very important that as you start to decouple or disaggregate that cloud, you really build strong capabilities for cloud engineering within your organization. Second, I think you need to start understanding that the network is now going to behave very much like the IT estate has been behaving for the last 20 plus years. And that means really starting to look at that network like the way it has been looked at in the IT world. And that is a very different perspective than the traditional perspective that we had, where we used to buy monolithic systems uh, from the network equipment providers and just deploy them, uh, put a box in. It was specialized in creating one service and I did it really well. Uh, and you didn't really need to open the box too much and look inside. Well, as you do this uh, cloud, universal cloud, as I call it, it's very important that you have proper engineering skills in house. The other thing is, if you're gonna build all of these capabilities that you'll be able to orchestrate this cloud, which is gonna be across the country. We have 90 old locations across the country so far. And you need to orchestrate that whole thing as a single cloud. So instead of 90 different locations being managed independently and being orchestrated differently, we need to orchestrate it as a single unit. And that requires quite a bit of uh, rethinking in the way not only we design networks, and not only the way we build capabilities, but also how we manage it, how we operate it. So your entire operating model within the company has to be rethought. And I think it needs to get a bit more standardized than uh, what it has traditionally been in the uh, industry. So that is another big change that one needs to make in this, uh, in the operating model. Then the third part is as you create these capabilities, you need to make sure that you have that in, you know, independent integration capabilities for different kinds of services. So the system integration part of, of this new cloud becomes very, very important. And once we build those skills, 
you can actually create lots of new services which i think are going to be critical for india because india does not only need cheap connectivity india needs our industry telcos really to become the base platform the horizontal industry instead of the vertical on which the entire digital india will be built and in order to do that you really need to build very strong si capabilities either with yourself or in partnership with someone else so all, those are the key success factors uh, that i see are are requisite for success in future thanks ashan and i think uh, very rightly said creating the capabilities having a universal network approach getting the skills in place who can build that and uh, using si in order to innovate uh, what the users really require in terms of different business cases um, all very very relevant uh, moving on uh, sandeep i i would like your perspective because we also talked about how these network transformation will happen at the infra level and uh, you know even the transport uh, layers uh, what are your thoughts as a vendor in terms of uh, what all is being done in order to create and what we can provide as vendors to the operators uh, in the future i echo the comments that uh, all the cdos made uh, i think uh, one thing that i would say is uh, all of this needs to be in uh, looked at holistically Uh, what i mean is uh, you look at to look at the infrastructure is the physical layer is and to look at the architecture model you know which we we all talked about whether it is virtualization as in nfp or cloud native capabilities or distributed cloud or ai so that's the architecture model that i see and the third is the the operation operating model which is by that and let's focus on the uh, physical infrastructure right so i i also believe that Uh, whether it is affordability, whether it is longevity, building the right infrastructure, building the plans and building it right is the best for the longer term. Um, and uh, you know, let's say I come from a fiber company background, uh, so uh, fiberization is the key. Uh, we still have very low level of fiberization for five uh, G towers in in hot towers in uh, uh, India. Much lesser, like they are from sixty to twenty percent compared to US, probably seventy to eighty percent. That something is going to happen in there. But I, I would also say the physical space, infrastructure space, is that in terms of uh, deployment, that's something that generally we are lacking. So instead of a digitized and automated model of deployment, there is you know wired or wireless, right? The third piece that I see that is. What we are looking at is the convergence of infrastructure. So, let's say from SDL perspective, so this is a big thing. But from SDL perspective, we talk about uh, convergence between client and market, client and market, and then uh, convergence between hardware and software, uh, from silicon to software, and the third is connectivity and compute. Think of edge compute. So, uh, if you do all uh, these things from a uh, hard From infrastructure convergence, infrastructure fiberization, make sure you have efficiencies in uh, uh, deployment. Um, I think those are the levers that are essential to support the upper layer architecture model and operating model. So that is something that I would take a look at. And then architecture model. Actually, I, I I also think that you know uh, we have to think of this holistically. For example, automation uh, will not happen if cloudification doesn't happen. So, cloudification will not happen if, let's say, cloudification. I talk about say containers, microservices, containers, orchestration. It is not going to happen if you know we don't have uh, virtualization under the NFT, right? And all of this is not going to work very well if we do not implement DevOps or DevLabs or that stuff. So, point I'm making is. That on the architecture model layer also uh, an operating model are linked together and uh, needs to be looked at the holistic framework and the decision calculation needs to be taken into uh, a longer term consideration as well as what uh, uh, Mr. Vora said in terms of new revenue opportunities. So uh, this is how I believe uh, from infrastructure, architecture, and operations perspective. 
Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, your audio is not very clear, so maybe either you have to rejoin or just uh, um, check, uh, you know, for the next okay. question. Okay. So anyway, moving on to Vikram, uh, to okay. you. And, uh, uh, I know from uh, CNR perspective, you guys are, uh, you know, one of the things that will also change with this transition is the customers. Uh, for instance, enterprise customers will become more and more important. Uh, and play a much bigger role, whether it's the enterprise through the CSPs or directly. Um, and they will have different expectations from. So your thoughts on how this vertical industry partnership, which will become part of this whole transition journey, uh, with what 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 steps do we need to take from the network perspective uh, in order to uh, you know kind of move into a right direction there? Sure, Amit. So I think uh, you know. Before we get into what are the steps taken on the vertical, uh, you know, with the vertical industry partners, I think let's uh, demystify what the enterprise requirements really are, right? Uh, the enterprise requirements, you know, when the enterprise CIO is really building applications for vertical specific use cases today, uh, they are aware that 5G can actually bring in a lot more value, uh, what they can take it back to their LOBs. Right, and that's primarily because of the sheer nature of uh, low latency and highly flexible services that 5G can bring. Right now, what are these verticals which would really look at these kind of services? That would primarily be connected manufacturing. It would be automobile. It could be uh, you know mining, energy and uh, utilities. Right, uh, and uh, education and retail and BFSI. Right, so these would really be the verticals. And uh, you know. Uh, so what could telcos perhaps do you know, to address these complexities when they make these partnerships? I think uh, they're broadly around three or four technical aspects and uh, one or two software aspects, right? Uh, so uh, you know, uh, from a technical side, I think as rightly mentioned by uh, Randeep and Vishant, it's you know, automation would be very, very critical, right? Uh, because that network slicing and uh, multi-access edge computing would be the foundation for these new services. Right uh, and uh, automation would be uh, very critical from a threefold aspect. A, the dynamic slice would require to be provisioned, policies to be tweaked for a particular industry vertical or for uh, you know even uh, you know a particular customer. Right. Uh, the second thing is it will give the flexibility for a telco to adopt the hyperscaler model of policy that if you can measure it, you can bill it. Right. So it really helps you add more uh, 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 monetary value to it. The third thing is you can customize KPIs, right? With automation, so you can actually offer customized KPIs to the end customers, which is what the customers are really looking at because of the uh, you know flexible SLAs that you can offer per industry or per customer, right? Uh, the second area is obviously the new radio. I think uh, you know the new radio is something which telcos are still looking at, uh, you know, from the business case standpoint, economic value addition standpoint. But I think it gives you that flexibility to steer traffic and use AI ML cap capabilities on new innovative radio functions uh, to, you know, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, enhance the quality of experience. Right. The third area is the multi-access edge computing because that becomes re very relevant. And as uh, Vishant rightly pointed out, right, they've already virtualized around 90 locations. And I know most telcos globally, and especially in India are leveraging the real estate which they have to build these edge and aggregation clouds uh, virtual uh, you know the data centers there moving network functions there but you could actually use these edge clouds as launch pads for the vertical industry partners you know so so uh, and the fourth and the most important uh, technical aspect is also the security because security is very very dear to the enterprise and uh, you know so you will obviously need to build security around physical aspects for your next sites, uh, network security, and also protecting the data integrity, right? On the software aspects, I think you will need to, uh, you know, as Randi rightly pointed out, build the cloud talent, right? Uh, so cloud talent becomes very critical, uh, you know, uh, which is there today with the hyperscalers and telcos are really are building that. Uh, you could also, the, the second software aspect is around creating valuable partnerships, whether it comes with SI partners, whether it comes with these vertical industry partners, getting the revenue models right, the go-to-market strategy right, dividing the costs equally, and also the around who holds the intellectual property. So I think these are the complexities. If you can get them resolved, 
you could efficiently use 5G to cater to a completely different aspect of customers, which is the enterprise, uh, and get add more value to them and also create more value for your, for the telcos themselves, moving away from what uh, you know consumer services could give, which we all know is anyways challenged both from a revenue and a profitability standpoint. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. And uh, uh, David, uh, you know, we talked about the enterprise side, but this pandemic has actually shown us that even the, the consumers um, in the last six months we've discovered are using, there's a, like a digital transformation already happening, you know, e-health, e-commerce, um, so many things which were not existing or were uh, there but not so, so much used are now, so the demand from the networks, the demand from the operators is going to change very fast. How do you think networks of the future uh, are catering or will cater to this uh, change? So, so firstly, as you say, COVID has had a massive impact on the demand for um, uh, e-healthy education, uh, definitely remote education occurring across the globe, in fact, and very particularly in India. Um, so the first issue that's got to be challenged on, on these things or solved is uh, basic connectivity. And fixed wireless access really gives uh, a rapid vehicle and cost-efficient vehicle to help enable that connectivity. But quite quickly, I think people who have experienced uh, either the remote consultations in, in health or remote education, you realize that best effort connectivity really isn't good enough. Uh, you need to start having a bit more determinism in your connectivity. Um, so you need a network that's not just best effort like the public internet is today, uh, but also can guarantee certain performance characteristics, delay, etc. It's no good a teacher stood up in front of a classroom virtual and some people are streaming and buffering some aren't it just destroys the whole um experience so we move to a more deterministic uh, type of behavior but then say taking education example we see a very clear path to a more immersive education where you can use uh, virtual reality to teach uh, pupils and engage the pupils in an amazing way uh, using mixed media type formats to take pupils to places they could never ever visit. And when that, that might be in the classroom or it might be at home. But you can really start seeing that a need for a, a VR take capabilities. And at that point, delay or motion to photon, as it's called, is absolutely key. It must be less than 12 uh, milliseconds uh, latency, but ideally needs to be less than seven milliseconds. And Similarly, in eHealth, you, you know, you start with uh, vitals monitoring, you move through to remote consultations, I think some of us have already have, and you start uh, going forward, you envisage even uh, remote emergency assistance. And of course, this places a lot of um, emphasis on reliability and the security of the network. So with these types of um, services, plus normal public uh, internet, you've got a complete diverse range of uh, service types. Then if you fold in, the uh, uh, enterprise ones we mentioned before, you see a very, very neat, uh, absolute key need to have a toolkit of resources that allow you to build one network but slice it, slice it in a way that meets each service need. That is realistically the only way to build this network efficiently. You can't build a separate network for every one. So for me, the new network is going to have a toolkit of capabilities to slice the network. And we move from best effort connectivity to deterministic connectivity. Thanks, David. I think very well said. Um, slicing, of course, will play an extremely important role. And coming back to you, uh, Randeep, um, I know you've been very vocal and very passionate about AI and ML as a topic. Um, can you give us some examples that people can relate to how AI and ML in the future is going to play a significant role and as I heard you and seen your interviews in other uh, places where you've been quite quite vocal about that so some examples how how that can be used in order in this transformation yeah Amit uh, <coughs> it's not only in future I would say in present world also uh, at least in Atl we are seeing uh, that AI is really impacting let's start with various legs of building a network right from planning from uh, building uh, capacities, 
predicting where the capacity will be needed so that you can build in advance before the customer experience goes bad. And if we talk about new site planning, you can actually use multiple layers of information from earlier only population data to a lot of other data to actually face read the map and see the population dwelling, the roof types, the road types, and kind of generate economic index of the area before you roll out a site. So this is all possible with the, uh, you can say AI techniques which are available. With machine learning, you can start predicting many, many things uh, which we will have to be, uh, you know, which we have to build in future. Let's talk about deployment. Now deployment, uh, earlier there used to be a person who is going to install it, power it on, and then it used to be a person who used to configure it, somebody used to automate it, and then it used to continue for automation for some period of time. But now the way we roll out our networks is zero touch. You just connect it, it is fed the, you know, the configuration remotely, and all the automation happens uh, through, uh, uh, you can say, closed loop process. So that's another way which will all will be even more mature when we come to 5G. I was talking to one of our partner operators outside India, where they said when they had to choose the sector, should the 5G sector be a 90 degree sector or a 60 degree sector? Now, there is two ways. You can go and put it and see whether it works or not. Or you can actually have a machine learned model which will predict this is the traffic on 4G what should be the sector configuration for this 5G sector? Imagine the power of it. You can optimize your CapEx if you were able to really precisely calculate what you need to put, where you need to put. Let's talk about operations. Right now, traditional operations is you see an alarm, you call somebody, he goes and fixes it. How about if you were able to predict an alarm using the history and you are able to predict an alarm, and then if you do a closed loop and you can do a self heal that means you are able to fix it. I'm telling you, this is not fiction. We do it today. Yes, I am not able to predict all the alarms, but there are certain set of alarms which gives you like a telltale sign before a uh, hardware goes down. So you can use these telltale signs and predict. I can tell you, we can even predict that this SIM is going to go down because SIM does send some messages if it is not able to connect the network. So if we were to put all this into uh, learned algorithms and come into predictive uh, network maintenance and then a selfie loop, somewhere it may be possible, some way it may not be possible. But prediction already gives you a headroom to head start to go and fix it before it goes down. So we need a lot of tools, but more than tools, I said the workforce, the leadership, the people who do will need a digital mindset. They will need to come out of a traditional way of running uh, networks and start running networks in an automated way and not be afraid of a job loss, but look at job creation with these new opportunities happening. And I, I, you started this whole talk by saying what all has India contributed to the world telco. I believe that with the Indian brains, so much of software for almost all OEMs are being written here. So if these automation use cases are really brought in India and we can contribute to the world, believe me, this is one big contribution to uh, the world by India. If we talk about 5G specifically, there will be a RIC there. In RIC, there will be many use cases in an ORAN atmosphere. So if in an ORAN atmosphere, the use cases or the IPR of that use cases are coming from Indian, uh, you can say, engineers, then this is another value which will create in creating these automated networks. So in my view, this is the only way to go. This is not like a, a good to have. It is a must have, especially with the complicated networks we have. And we have these all you know, complicated IP optic networks, long haul, short haul, like uh, they was mentioning the front haul and the uh, this thing all will merge. Network will become very flat. So in that case, uh, automation, digitization is not, uh, it's not, uh, you can say a cho choice. It's a must have. And we all should uh, kind of start building it now. Thanks, Sandeep. And uh, I can tell you as a user, uh, if I am called by my operator and said that there is going to be an outage or there is something, or even if I call for a problem and they say this is the problem, this is when it's going to get fixed. It's so much of a delight for a customer uh, to be able to get that, that information. And actually, some of the things that you are talking about sounds like magic, uh, but magic is happening in the networks of tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a fact. Um, Vishal, I'm coming to you. Uh, uh, all this also requires, uh, you did touch upon in your earlier talk, uh, on, on the entire processes, the organization structure, how we need to change ourselves, uh, you know, uh, as these networks involve. So your thoughts on what needs to be done uh, on that side? 
I mean, so, so many of the things that Randeep uh, said, uh, I would I would agree with it uh, wholeheartedly. I think the future is about uh, uh, much more automation, much more about what I call augmented intelligence instead of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think that for me, it's a very important distinction because while we will be doing a lot of AI stuff, uh, we're always going to have human beings, people uh, there, and all of these technologies are going to be there to assist. So uh, things like zero touch provisioning, you know, we, we've done it. Uh, we've been doing it in our transport networks now for for a while. Uh, it's going to come in other domains as well. Uh, Machine learning and AI, I think, are absolutely critical and essential if you're going to run a very large, large-scale cloud, which we all have to uh, for our networks, uh, and especially if it's a decoupled software and hardware and a universal cloud, then the only real way to do it, uh, manage it, is through AI ML. And in order to do all that, I think you need to have a proper set of understanding of your vision right so the vision has to be very clear about what you're building for in order for a lot of these things like ai ml to work and those capabilities i i think are going to be a journey again i'll use the word journey uh it is not going to happen all overnight it is it is a journey for the next two three years while we develop uh, a lot of these ai ml uh, capabilities I think the point about India being the software uh, factory of the world is an incredibly important and critical. Because as we start to open up our networks, whether it is in the core, radio, or transport, software becomes much more valuable. The value shifts much more towards that software. And India has a, has a great you know, possibility here to become the software uh, leader of the world in the telecom space. And there is so much more value that we can create as an industry. And India is, is probably the most challenging environment to operate in because we are a very large country. We have many uh, on the ground challenges. Uh, we have many environmental challenges. And if you develop software to cope with all of that, I think it will work anywhere in the world. So I think it's a great opportunity for us and for India to contribute to the rest of the world and, and the development of this industry. I think, uh, Amit, uh, what is also very important is to realize that uh, our industry is now going to become the base for a lot of the other industries. As I said earlier, we are a horizontal. And what that means is we used to have in industry, for example, very traditional things like concepts like, well, we used to have maintenance windows and downtimes yeah, from midnight or to 5 a.m. Or, or whatever it is that your company chose. But we used to have like those five, six hours where we could say the network can be, you know, will be maintained and it does, you know, we can do things with it. I think if you are the base of the digital economy of this country, you do not have that luxury. Your network has to continuously operate, and you will have to make continuous changes. So CI, CD, yeah, continuous uh, implementation, continuous deployment is the norm. So the CI, CD capabilities development is the next big thing that we are working on, and that requires things like AI and ML to come in, but it also requires a very different way of thinking about our own networks and what they're doing. So we have to start thinking much more about services that we run on top of those networks. And if, if we have decoupled our networks, which we have in, uh, in V uh, to a large extent, our core is completely desegregated now. So that means we buy our hardware separately and all of our software separately, and we have it uh, integrated with a third party SI. We are now doing the same things in the transport. So when you, do that in the transport in the IP layer, uh, and you start to deploy these white box routers, and you decouple that software. Uh, you know, getting that slicing to work the way you want to do it, you, know, you can maximally drive the value out of as a business. Is there is an opportunity here? I think for for all our companies, because I think there are things you can do with that slicing to marry it much closer to the the end user logic 
and marry it much more closer to your business priorities. And those things will create many more capabilities, even in our 4G networks. We don't need to wait for 5G to come, you know, come up with a full set of slicing capabilities. I think there are things we can do with 4G, uh, with slicing, that, uh, that will start generating revenue very quickly. And for that, I think things like white box routers are also going to be very, very important. Similarly, on the open RAN, I think it is going to be very important for India to have an open RAN system, not only to lower costs, but also, again, to create many more capabilities. When you open up that RAN, you can do so much more caching, content provisioning, et cetera, closer to the edge for the customer. So things like uh, facial recognition, things like uh, you know, caching, things like uh, SASC services, all of those things become much more possible with the edge cloud. And that's what we are seeing with our edge cloud that we have rolled out. So many more business opportunities become available to us. And all of the things we are doing, to some extent, while we're doing them for the first time in the world in telecom, it is not the first time in the world for any industry. Many of these things have been done by hyperscalers in their businesses. So there are things that are, you know, that are available, there are methodologies which are available from the hyperscalers that we can really import and, and, and customize for our businesses, really to create a, a world-class uh, leading universal cloud edge capability in our network. Thanks, Vishant. And I think that last point was very, very appropriate that we can learn from the world who has done it already and uh, build our skills and our, our, our capabilities. Uh, moving on, um, Sham, I think we have not touched upon use cases, uh, which may be 5G or even today 4G. But, I mean, Vishant said today we can do a lot, and all of you agree that we can do a lot with 4G also. Uh, but the use cases, which in 5G, which probably can help in, um, you know, this uh, urban rural divide, or actually create value for our companies, which are also then contributing to our lower cost. Amit, uh, I think this last six months of pandemic has actually um, given us a big, great insight around uh, the world of the future and the world and the responsibility of uh, telcos. Vishant actually alluded to the fact that we are a horizontal supporting this whole digital world which will uh, evolve itself in the coming decades. So one of the first things which uh, I'd like to highlight is uh, let us also understand that from when we moved from 3G to 4G and now to 5G, the service suit is now moving into three fundamental contributors. First is the connectivity, which has been the underlying uh, part of any telco business. But moving on from connectivity, I think two more things which are panning out very clearly is collaboration and productivity. And when we talk about collaboration, uh, we are talking about a multiple set of people and industry coming together either directly or indirectly and kind of doing their job in a, in a much better and a much uh, uh, efficient manner. And then the productivity part of it, which again can be broken up into what I call as assisted productivity and enhanced productivity. And assisted productivity is where this whole tool set or this whole service suit can make your life easier. Uh, look at a surgeon or look at an educator or look at a marketeer and look at the way they can go forward, use the whole digital value chain uh, to understand, use, process the data faster, come to decision points faster, uh, get their reach extended across geographies. So this is assisted productivity. And the enhanced productivity is when you can get into the tools doing the job themselves without any manual intervention. And this is about... Uh, uh, drones, security, cameras, and, and sensors moving all across the, the length and breadth of the country. And if you then map into the big industry 4.0 revolution that is that is happening now, you can very clearly see that the torchbearers here, education is very clearly a, a big one in a country like us, which is so devoid of the right set of talent to be connected for right set of uh, as right set of educators to the students. Uh, uh, the sharing of content across geographies, uh, the uh, conducting of um, uh, collaborative sessions across geographies and, and locations. So education is definitely a big one. Uh, uh, health, I think I can and none of us can even undermine the requirement of a very, very digitally connected uh, health ecosystem, uh, which is not only enhanced from a digital perspective, but which also 
extends the ability of technology to make those decisions much more faster much more right and and this whole hyperscale concept which all of us have been talking about i think comes to play here wherein multiple petabytes of real time data getting processed at an individual granular level decisions being made this is happening today at geo for example i'll i'll just give you the basic connectivity example uh, world does today close to 50 exabytes of data uh, in a in a month the mobile data consumption across the world slightly less than that actually uh, basis most of the reports 47 48 and we at geo are already ahead of 10% of that number at 5 exabytes uh, every month so our affinity as a country as a as a as a society to hyperscale is is not new our ability to understand and use this to our um, uh, uh, go forward decision making process go forward product enhancement techniques is also not new but what will become new is the way now these each of these service suits will be sliced and we spoke about islands of connectivity we spoke about islands of services we spoke about a uh, agriculture service suit for example and that is i think one of the biggest use case um, uh, looking at the dependence of the agriculture in our, our our gdp how do you enhance that right from weather forecasting to right set of crops to right set of um, uh, contribution from uh, source to sink from retail to outlets that kind of contribution is going to get big uh, uh, schools and hospitals are definitely uh, going to get connected uh, the other big use case in addition to these verticals i spoke about is the classic digitization of of of, of the industry manufacturing is 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 big example or um, uh, let's say uh, getting a network for an enterprise which is now getting big in some of the use cases in 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 europe where you actually dedicate a 5g network for a for for an industry itself or for a for a factory itself and imagine that happening for our automobile industries for our manufacturing sessions for our um, uh, agro business cases uh, it would be so much more efficient that without having to depend on any outside in kind of support the use case itself embeds their own bespoke use cases owned by their own network systems deployed by uh, the operator and then they become so much self dependent and so much uh, 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 productive because now they know that this network is dedicated to them this network is going to get customized for every new use case every evolved use case they need to to use it that will actually exponentially enhance uh the the productivity of not only an individual uh, from a connectivity and collaboration perspective but also from a uh, from a industry or from a overall enterprise ecosystem uh, wherein now they get to see a phase of the network which is not one size fits all but what they need how they need when and where they need and that is all possible when we are able to amalgamate all of these capabilities the the access network dedicated and sliced for a customer the connectivity network in which is evolving which is aware which is real time and then finally the overall orchestration of the services on 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 a big data system uh, which is already being done but which now gets very seamlessly extended towards a, uh, an end to end 5g ecosystem yeah absolutely right and i think that leads me to david to a question for you um you know sample we talked about the service suits and we talked about how service uh, creation and assurance and optimization will be extremely extremely critical and important in the future of network so your thoughts on how that can happen so um yeah i agree with that i mean it really is about um the service creation ease of automation rapid assurance is all about um group for me it's about breaking down the digital divide making sure that everybody has access to this technology and then providing the advanced connectivity to enable cities regions the whole of india in fact to win on the global marketplace and to achieve this relies on the ability to provide cost efficient connectivity rapidly to the right places within within the the country and randip hit the nail right on the head when he said automation is fundamental to allow this to happen with the, all this complexity in the network in this world of uh, dynamic mobile type connectivity with sdn and nfvs flexibly mixing dns and vnfs instantiating them wherever and whenever required to make this cost efficiency and to give connectivity where it's required you can only really achieve this with automation and that 
with the right level of automation, you can really drive connectivity across the country and now allow everyone to gain the advantage of the connectivity that's been offered by 5G. In addition, I would add that analytics is also key to this. As the first part of the AI journey, you need the right analytics uh, to monitor the performance of the network, and the services running on it, and then to dynamically adjust the network to keep the services to, uh, being delivered at the optimal level. And if there is unfortunately no network degradation or outages, you can react as uh, Randy said again, many times proactively in advance of the failure or degra degradation, you can react, change the network to make sure you keep that reliability and that network up and going. So for me, with the right level of rapid service creation and newly dynamic services across that network, making sure that the network's up and running all the time, but then with the right level of optimization, so that you don't need to over-provision the network, you can cost efficiently deliver services across the whole of your country. You really empower your country and your regions in that competitive uh, um, environment that they're fighting, and you really are able to take full advantage of this. So automation enables the instrumentation that's delivered in the programmable infrastructure, and that is required for 5G to fully empower a country to move forward. That, that's my thoughts on it. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think we are uh, running uh, almost on time and little short of time. So, Vikram, quickly to you, you know, SDN, NFP, we know is a big part of this journey and you are an expert on that. Um, so, your thoughts on how much and how, how that is going to play a role in this journey? So I, mean, I think SDI and NFE have been key pillars of telco network transformation right from the beginning of 4G. I think SDN is the key foundation to make networks more programmable, as, as uh, Sham had rightly pointed out in the beginning. And you know, SDN allows the environment to have uh, the white box routers, what Vishant was measuring, uh, talking about, right? And same thing is with NFE, right? It's allowing you to virtualize more, uh, more network functions, pulling them out of, uh, you know, fixed hardware, proprietary hardware, and moving on to COT servers. Uh, with the modernization of uh, powerful processors, storage fabric, storage and switching fabrics, right? Uh, you can actually move more network functions now to be VNFs and even cloud net, uh, you know, cloud native going forward, right? And uh, the only thing I think is that, you know, telcos are building VNFs or NFE clouds more vertically stacked. Uh, rather than having a horizontal cloud uh, where they could build in the IT functions along with the network core functions. But I think with the advent of edge and moving more network functions to the edge, uh, you know, they'll be building the mano along with the automation, which we've all been talking about. And that will really give the efficiencies of scale, uh, you know, what uh, the value NFE and SDN could really bring, right? And uh, that's why NFE and SDN, according to me, will continue to be key pillars of the telco transformation, Absolutely. even as we move from four. And um, you know, in the end, Sandeep, if I can just, uh, I, I will, I can do this uh, conclusion and summarization. But if this discussion, you can summarize in, you know, what are the top three things that we need to do in the networks of the future in order to make this journey transform. Yeah. So first thing that I will say, I think uh, there are a lot of things that were covered in terms of. Uh, architecture, applications, AI, ML, you know, lots of things. But I think I would just say that uh, physical infrastructure innovation there also is important and critical. And part of this also is uh, uh, infrastructure sharing. So there a lot has been done in terms of fiber sharing, spectrum sharing. You now that, that is, you know, the models are there from, uh, from uh, uh, in India, from US, from Brazil. Uh, and especially in the case of 5G, especially when you look at uh, on the small cell and the 5G IoT macro layer. I, I think I read a study at McKenzie. We can operators can save up to 40% of, of DCO in that area. So it, that infrastructure sharing is, uh, I, I think, definitely uh, important uh, and critical aspect. And then third is uh, build it once and build it right. That is what I will find about uh, infrastructure, right? And uh, the uh, capabilities that you know. That, if I have to sum up in again, there are four things that come to my mind. Infrastructure, uh, the uh, architectures, that is with applications, the operating model, and the business model. 
and all four need to uh, be think holistically together to make it happen. And again, uh, SIs, you know, like us, play a significant role not only at the physical layer and the virtual layer, at the all the way up to the cloud native layer to stitch these VNFs and CNFs together in a cloudified way to really uh, get to uh, value or customer experience for, uh, for, uh, from a services perspective. I think all of this is going to be critical. Uh, as I, uh, you know, again, summing it up, physical infrastructure sharing, uh, operating model, architecture, as well as uh, the business model. All four working together. And uh, before we end, at the end, I'll just ask all the three CTOs one common question um, in a short and crisp one line answer or two line answer. That with 5G happening, or you know, as the networks migrate or transit to the path towards 5G, and what? So this is a software question saying that what really you think is the highest or the biggest thing that 5G will bring, either to your companies as a business or to the end consumer, according to. So let me start with uh, Vishanti. So uh, I think 5G as a technology brings better latencies. So that creates many more kind of uh, real-time applications uh, as a, you know as a possibility. Uh, now there is a additional thing that 5G brings, which is ability to handle billions of devices uh, in just uh, you know being able to connect uh, in in parallel. So I, th I think that is going to be important as India gets into a much more kind of a, a IoT deployment across a suite of industries. I, I think that is another important benefit that will come with 5G. And then, of course, there's the, the spectrum. Now, spectrum is, uh, is, is the biggest thing. And, uh, you know, I, I really think there are lessons to be learned here from Japan and China who have looked at the spectrum and said, Hey, this is a you know this is a, a base layer for the digital economy of the future, and we don't want to you know, suck money out of the industry up front. And what we want to do is have the industry be able to use this spectrum to create a, a very strong, robust network and and then capabilities on which all of the other other industries will build value. So therefore, spectrum can be given for free. I think that is something worth considering for this country. Thanks, uh, Randy. Your thoughts. You know, I will take a little different pitch on it. I think, first of all, for India itself, like we see this COVID, I mean, we were not used to virtual meetings. We were not used to virtual collaborations. We always wanted physical. And the digital transformation, whether it is about a consumer recharging digitally or us doing meetings virtually, I think we were not very comfortable doing it. But pandemic kind of way triggered us into thinking like this. I think 5G will trigger India into thinking faster into the digital India dream. And I think that I hope will become a trigger which will unleash the power of digitization, not across the telco, but across all domains of industries. I mean, one of my colleagues mentioned it can be manufacturing, it can be mining, it can be BFSI, but all industries will get an impetus because of this. Suddenly some new thing is available, which will transform the way they run their business, bring efficiencies and new possibilities. Coupled with this is telcos who are today used to connectivity revenue as the largest part of their revenue will also see capabilities and of other new revenue streams coming in where they can be a deeply embedded partner to the industries in helping this industry 4.0 or digital India dream. I think these two things will happen as 5G starts gathering. It could be starting with the POC networks and subsequently real commercial. But I think it will definitely trigger a faster momentum towards digital India. So that's what I see for 5G doing good. Um, so um, again, more or less similar with what Vishant and Randeep said, but just rephrasing it. One is very clearly capacity and capability. Capacity from a spectrum um, and type of services perspective and capability from uh, uh, designing the ability to design specific services. But more importantly, I think, uh, going forward, the way world is getting uh, digital, uh, I think it would be one of the underlying threats across the life of human beings, life of machines and life of industries and entrepreneurs uh, uh, going forward, wherein it would be unimaginable 
uh, to live, to survive, and to work and to enhance without uh, a digital platform. And this digital platform will be provided by 5G uh, in total um, as 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 the connectivity capability and service partnership. Thank you. And I think on that positive note, uh, the dream of digital India, you know, being fulfilled with 5G as a technology, and India playing a much much bigger role in the world in not only uh, network affordability, but giving them the software, the IPRs, the future uh, automation uh, that the world will follow. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you all, gentlemen, for being on this panel. At least for me, it was a, a fantastic uh, discussion and a learning. I hope uh, our audience will also like and enjoy this uh, discussion. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, I will say. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. In the age of networks, everyday tasks are global events. Remember when a concert was just for the fans in the stadium? Now it gets shared out to millions, thousands of miles away. The biggest show on TV isn't just on TV, and getting in shape means everyone knows how fit we are. Yeah. So with thousands of new devices talking to the network every minute, Providers have never been under more pressure to deliver. In the midst of all the complexity, it feels like a race for survival. There's a lot of talk that the key to survival is network automation, that automation equals intuition, which it literally doesn't, and that a self-driving network is enough to expel complexity if you're not going very far. At Sienna, we don't fear complexity, we welcome it. Because we believe in a bigger idea, something we call the adaptive network. It's a unique combination of automation and intelligence guided by human insight that's built on a highly scalable, programmable infrastructure. It's a network that's set up to figure things out faster, grab hold of new technology, and keep growing and changing just like we do, all with the most open architecture and flexibility in the business. That's how we build the adaptive network. Because in this race, survival of the fittest is survival of the most adaptive. Get ready to adapt. It's been said, two are better than one, stronger than one, greater than one, and more potent than one. It's true, two are better than one when the two act as one. And together, we too are one. Ribbon and ECI, one team. Thank you for the insightful discussion. I hope all of you found the discussion informative and enjoyable. With that, I take your leave, but please leave your comments and feedback on the video of this session, which will be available on the Live Mint and India Mobile Congress social media handles. We will be back with the fifth episode of this eight episode series soon. Till then, stay safe and take care.